Coming from an area like Surrey, where a large proportion of lay sites are non-prehistoric ones, such as churches, it was a spectacular experience to visit a part of Britain rich in prehistoric remains. This was Kirkubrishire, on the southwest peninsula of Scotland, Britain's Chin, where I accompanied some members of the Northern Earth Mysteries Group on their weekend in late September 1982. The cottage where we stayed was a fitting prelude to the weekend, with a beautiful view across from the inlet of the Solway Firth to the hills beyond. The view changed from minute to minute as different lights came, and a little further up the coast was an island, of which we had a good view on our walk the first evening. As the tide went out, a clear causeway to the island could be seen, though we didn't find the history of this, or whether it's still passable. The first site visited the next day was a rather dilapidated stone circle, Park of Tongland, of which only three stones remain, although the view is spectacular. The next site, Geordieland, was a series of cup and ring markings on an outcrop, rather worn but still generally perceptible. As with all others found on this trip, it was in an elevated position, with a good view and quite a strong wind. From here we proceeded to high banks, for which we had to pass through a farm. As we came up to the gate, we were immediately surrounded by dogs. A bit unnerving at first, we were soon to find these were unusually friendly for farm dogs. Possibly it was because people quite often visit the site. One of the best examples of cup and ring markings on a stone outcrop. The dogs led the way almost as if they were officials, and drank noisily from some water that had collected on the outcrop. The markings were very spectacular. The grooves forming the rings were quite deep, and in some places the cups were so closely packed together that it was hard to believe they represent features of the land, unless, of course, they're a kind of shading representing woodland or something of that sort. The next site, Drummore, was a large stone circle, 92 feet in diameter, with only four stones remaining. As with the other sites, there was a high wind with a continuous noise. This tends to fit in with a recent theory of mine regarding stone circles, that they boost earth energy by trans transducing sound, as opposed to barrows which seem to be accumulators of the transduced energy on the Reich pattern, fitting in also with Lethbridge's concepts of Naiad, Oread and Nereid fields. Sounds during rituals could have added to these. The principle would have, within the room would have been the reverse one from the one in which people receive tingling vibrations from stones generated by earth energy. Uh, that is, the transducer would work both ways, using vibration to boost the energy or using the energy to produce vibration. There was a good view in two directions from this site. As we approached Cambrit Hill on Sunday morning, the tall television mast with its attendant microwave dishes were the first things in evidence. The wind howled to a crescendo as we neared the building and parked, but it was to prove a helpful wind, for it provided a break as we walked down the hill, and returning allowed us almost to sail back up. On walking down the hill, which was rather rough moorland country, very wet in parts, the first find was a stone angled almost like a desk facing the hill on the opposite side of the valley. This bore two quite good ring carvings, which stood out even better when wetted with water from the pool at the base of the stone. This stone seemed to be a placed stone rather than an outcrop. A little further on we found what seemed to be the remains of a cairn circle with an off-centre kist. It would seem that this circle, though not the kist, was in alignment with the ring-marked stone and a very large cairn on the opposite hillside. At the bottom of the hill was a small stream with a fence. Once crossed it, uh, we were excited to find a small standing stone on the alignment with the cairn, which was now looming larger. Continuing to the cairn, we found there was a crater on the top where some Victorian digging had evidently been done. There was a considerable number of large quartz crystal rocks among the stones making up its sides. From the top of the cairn, yet another feature on the alignment could be seen, a small stone circle. On arriving there, it was found that several of the stones were surrounded by pools of water, 
It was thought possibly because of the action of cattle attracted to the stones. The stone circle was in an unusual position. Looking towards the hills, it would seem to be in a valley, yet looking between them, it seemed to be on a hill. The wind was strong at all points along the alignment, as it seemed to be funnelled along the valley, a good place for energy boosters, if the previously mentioned theory is correct. It was also mentioned by Brian Larkman that it seemed to be at the point of balance between the yin of the hills and the yang of the valley. This trip was before the days of digital photography, but this spectacular visual alignment was recorded on graphics composed of text characters produced on the WordWise word processor on the BBC microcomputer. The top of Canharrow Hill, the opposite hill from the TV mast, was grooved by three quite deep depressions. The alignment pointed to the left-hand edge of the middle one of these, where there seemed to be a slight ledge of some kind. Coming back to the cars, it could clearly be seen that the alignment didn't pass through the microwave station, but some way to the right of it. The next site to be visited, Glen Quicken, entailed quite a trek across country, negotiating fences and leaping across streams. It was also raining quite hard, but the site turned out to be well worth it, the most complete stone circle of the trip, with a large rounded central pillar taller than any of the stones in the circle. The circle was about 48 feet in diameter, made of a material containing quite large quartz crystals. The material seemed to be a locally occurring stone, as a nearby dry stone wall was made of it. As with the others, there was a high wind noise at the site, and the stream was not far away. We trekked across some deeply ploughed furrows to find another circle nearby, but this was unfortunately very badly damaged, and it was impossible even to judge its diameter. Circling back another way, we returned to the cars over a very badly made dry stone wall, whose stones slid everywhere as soon as weight was put on them. After a very pleasant meal at a pub in Creetown, we went to Kirkdale House, where we had made prior arrangements to see some examples of prehistoric carvings that had been taken there. When we arrived, we were faced with three doorbells and three names, but Hannay proved to be the correct one, Shades of 39 steps. The people were very pleasant and showed us to a small arbour in the garden, one with superb view of the sea and the Isle of Man beyond. In this shelter were several fine examples of cup and ring carvings, as well as two crosses, which could have been Christianised standing stones. Some of these carved stones had two parallel lines coming from the centre, as had been noticed elsewhere. It reminded us very, very much of the aerial view of Stonehenge, in which the path, which is supposed to be modern, comes from the centre to the outside. When seeing this photograph many years ago, it made me think of a sperm cell penetrating an egg. The carvings resembled this too, but what seemed amazing on the Kirkdale House carving was that there were other objects depicted which seemed rather like free-swimming sperm. Another shield-like object with a ring of cups between two concentric rings could have been a fertilised egg developing. A far-fetched theory perhaps, even though the ancient structures almost certainly had some connection with fertility. It would entail the concept of a prehistoric microscope. However, when one thinks of other achievements of the prehistoric world, who knows? Philip Heselton notes that Brian Larkman has mentioned that the Theosophists had a technique of some sort, of mental projection, whereby they could get right inside the atom and describe its structure. This at a time when the atom was still, still seen as being the smallest unit in existence. Recent scientific discoveries have confirmed their findings to a remarkable degree. Perhaps the prehistoric people had a similar technique, whereby they could see the life processes which were generally too small to see with the unaided eye. Next door to Kirkdale House was the impressive site of Cairn Holy, two huge long barrows, each with large stones visible at one end. The position was very elevated, once more with a good view of the sea and the Isle of Man. 
Cairn Holy too had a dolmen top behind its entrance stones. There were also two quite large boulders outside the entrance. One seemed to be water-rounded granite and the other some kind of stratified rock with some quartz crystals in it. The midline of Cairn Holy 1 was seen to align with the back end of Cairn Holy 2 and it was very interesting to find that evening that this alignment also runs to Cambret Hill, meeting the hill hilltop at the same point as the Cairn Harrow alignment. Cairn Holy 2 There were once some cup and ring markings at the Cairn Holy site, but these have been removed to a museum. On Monday morning, while taking me to my train at Dumfries, Philip Heselton took me to see the Twelve Apostles Stone Circle, a very large one. Despite the fact that a hedge had been unheedingly built across the circle, and that there were only seemed to be eleven stones remaining, remaining now, it was an impressive sight. One of the stones seems to be an outlier, unless the circle has a very pointed shape, for it aligns with two of the other stones, which would not be possible in a circle or ellipse. The information board at the Twelve Apostles suggests that to the northeast of the monument there are remains of two cursus monuments.